Preach of Thanksgiving and his courts of praise. Now, those of you who are skeptical and you're visiting and you go, well, now they're going to rev them up. That's exactly right. I don't know about you, but I've had a good day. God has been good all day long. When I woke up this morning, my mind was working as well as it ever does. And there was air in my lungs and my blood was pumping through my veins and I looked out and I saw the sun shine and I thought what a great and mighty God we serve so I want to encourage you to just shake all the religion that you may have brought in with you off your hands right now because if God has been so good to you you ought to praise him
This is a song that we offer up to you, Jesus. We offer up to you our praise. We offer up to you our adoration tonight. This is a song we offer up to you. You've come here tonight because you're hungry for Jesus. And you know, I didn't come tonight just to sing a bunch of songs and there's no list up here and I have no idea what we're gonna do next. I want you to understand, how many of you are visiting Brownsville for the first time? There's a sound that's trying to come from heaven and it's not, it doesn't need any of us to come. But I believe God wants to bring a sound to his church. And I want to admit to you now, I don't know how to tap into that. I know how to sing some songs, but I want to know. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him glorified. And I want to tell you something. This is practice for worship. When we see Jesus and, and the Father is on his throne and 
we see the glassy sea and we see all the angels and the cherubims and the seraphim and the saints and the 24 elders and we're all with Jesus. That'll be the real thing. Until then, we're just going to practice. And so I don't feel the need to perform to you tonight. So if you came expecting a performance, I'm just going to experiment for the next 30 minutes or so. And I just want you to know, Jesus, that I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And these people who have come into this place tonight here at Brownsville, they haven't come here, Lord, to spectate. They've come here because they're hungry, Jesus. We're hungry, Lord. Hungry I come to you, for I know you satisfy. I am empty, but I know your love does not run dry. So I'll wait for you.
offering everything I am And I'm falling on my knees Falling on my knees I'm falling on my knees Jesus, you're all this heart is living for And I'm falling on my knees I'm falling on my knees Jesus, your all this heart is living for Jesus, your all this heart is living Jesus, you're all I live for. Jesus, you're all I breathe for. Jesus, you're all I need. You're all I need. Oh, and your love will dry the tears from my eyes and your mercy will wash the shame from my face love. and your peace comes in like a crashing flood blowing fear away oh peace of the Lord peace of the Lord bring a peace of the Lord And the glory of the Lord brightens the darkest nights. The glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your voice. Hallelujah. Bless his holy name. Bless
bless his holy name 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 sing it to the lord now bless your holy name bless your holy name bless your holy name all of the earth say bless him bless your holy name bless your holy name bless your holy name now i'm going to take that up a little bit because i feel like maybe we need to stay there a minute
Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I love you. Come on, lift your voice. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Just one more. I just sense the Lord is wanting to do something here, and I'm just trying not to get in His way. Blessed be the Lamb of God. Blessed be the Lamb of God. takes away the sin of the world whose blood not only covers but it washes 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Lamb of God. Lift your vision higher tonight. Lift your vision higher. See the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ.
everyone to stand to your feet just for a minute. Stand to your feet before we move on with the service. I want everyone to stand to your feet. There are some people here, you feel that you um, are just not as spiritual as other folks around you. And, you know, you just, they seem to be more spiritual than you. They got more of God than you. And, folks, I want everyone to listen. God brings us to levels in our life, places in our life to help us grow. And many of you have come here tonight. How many of this is your first week at the revival? Lift your hand up high. Lift it up high so we can see it. Okay, you can put it down. We welcome you. And many of you, many of you may have come and you're on fire for God. And that's fantastic. Okay, we don't claim to have you know, the, the handle on this. We know people come here, they got God all over them. But many people come here, they want more of Jesus. They want God to touch their lives. And they get in this worship, they get in this realm, they get in this presence. And, and the first thing the devil will say to you is, you can't even come close to entering into this stuff. You're not worthy, you're not capable, you're not, you're not anywhere close like these people are. Well, friend, I've been there. I've had the devil on my back for years. He would, he would, because God would take me to places and always put me around people that were more spiritual than me. Is anybody listening? You know, you don't grow much when you get around people that aren't spiritual or less spiritual. But when you get around people that are more spiritual, he started putting me around the Raven Hills and the Wilkerson's. And then he moved me to Argentina and got me around Anacondia. You know, I thought I could cast out devils until I got around Carlos Anacondia. And he would cast out like a hundred at a time. You know, and, and you get around these more spiritual people. And the idea, friend, God's not saying, okay, back off. You've met your limit. This is as far as you're going to go with me. He's letting you be around this, friend, so you can grow, enter in. And right then I said, everyone lift their voice. And there's many people who did, but there's many people who didn't. And you did not lift your voice because you feel like, you know, what is it lifting my voice? I don't know what this is all about. I can't do this. I don't even know what I'm doing. Friend, God gave you your voice. And I want to tell you, you have, you have praised sports with your voice you have lifted up your voice and praised musicians you have praised you've been at concerts you've praised secular musicians perhaps you've you've lifted up your voice and given praise to man you've lifted up your voice and and with accolades towards a, a someone who did something and someone who who was in your estimation worthy of your praise well now Let's do something a little different. Let's lift up our praise, our voice to God. And if you, you can just, you can just harmonize out loud. It doesn't matter. It's just you're letting God know, God, I am at Brownsville this Friday night. I am all here. My body, my mind, my vocal cords, my eyes. I'm in this place and I'm going to lift up my voice. Worship you. I worship you, Lord. one more thing before we're seated okay how many we're going to be totally honest that's the beauty of the Brownsville revival is honesty how many have gone through some hellish waters this week lift your hand just you've really fought hell you've gone through some some trials this week lift up your hand okay lift up your hand you can put it down my hands up okay today I feel like I've had demons of hell chasing me all day, probably because of tonight's message but I've had the demons of hell all over me today just fighting me. No, they don't come in you, friend, but they'll sure buffet you. How many have been buffeted? Well, Lyndall, we're going to let God arise. And if this, let me tell you why we're going to sing this. We're going to sing this because people, three and a half million people have come through this church. 
They come from all over the world. How many are from outside the United States? Lift up your hand. Outside. Look at there. They come from what? You can put your hand down. They come from all over the world. And the devil knows what's about to happen. He knows God's going to touch you. He knows God's going to soak you. He knows God's going to fill you. He knows God's going to heal you. He knows God's going to set you free. And so the devil, the devil will come in here and he'll say, he'll whisper in your ear and he'll say, you're just here for a couple days. God ain't going to do nothing in you in a couple days. Boy, that's a lie he's tried to spread for you. Friend, it doesn't work. God's going to touch you tonight. Let God arise. Let God stand those of you at home we'd appreciate if you'd stand also we welcome everyone listening um, by radio those of you that have tuned into the broadcast those of you that have logged on to our websites 
we welcome you. Receive this today from um, South Africa. It says, I keep a close eye on your internet site and eagerly download every sermon. I don't think I have missed any in the last year. At least I thank our Lord for his provision of anointed men and women who will preach the word of God with conviction and without sugarcoating it. Many times, in fact, most times, I almost expected you to name me by name during your sermons. That's how on target you've been. It says, bless you both. And it's to John Kilpatrick and Steve Hill. And I know... They include Mike and Carrie and Lyndall and everyone else. We're not playing games at the Brownsville Revival. This is the hardest work I've ever been involved in in my life. I have worked around the world. We've planted churches. I've moved my family into impoverished areas. We've lived in ghettos. We've done things not to prove anything to man, but to show God that we're serious. We have worked hard all our lives but by far the Brownsville Revival is the hardest thing I have ever done. There's been more demonic attack from the Brownsville Revival than anything I've ever been involved in. The devil knows what this anointing is all about. He knows that it is the quickest way for the Word of God to spread and the, the power to spread through the nations. He knows it can happen almost overnight. And so he does everything he can to slow us down and to hold us back. Everyone standing, every night at the Brownsville Revival, we ask those of you that are attending, those of you that are listening at home to pray a simple prayer that God would speak to you and change your life. I do not get up at, at, at the evening services and give you some leftovers from some message that I preached three years ago, and I know I could. And there's nothing really wrong with preaching messages that have been preached before. George Whitfield said he's not really comfortable with the message until he's preached it 100 times. But I've, I've always gotten up in the morning and I want to feed myself first. And um, I know if God feeds me, he'll feed others. He led me to a scripture that he's shown me only once in this revival. It's a scripture that many of you are familiar with, but the majority of you are not. You may be familiar with the story, but you're going to see something tonight that perhaps I would believe that most of us in this place have never seen before. We're going to be turning the lights completely out in a few minutes, and I would appreciate it if everyone would remain seated. There will be some illustrations involved in this message, and um, I'd rather not have any distractions. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. I want everyone at home, you're going to pray this prayer. And whether you're a God lover or a God hater, you're going to pray this prayer. Now look at me, folks. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are here tonight. Those of you that are listening, you're listening through the audio phones, you're listening in a different language, hear me now. I'm Finnish. I'm, a, I'm from Finnish background. I've traveled all over this world. I love the Finns. I love the Germans. I love, I've been through the Netherlands. I've been through Sweden. I've been through Switzerland. I've, I've been in a lot of areas of this world. I love this world. I love the people of this world. But just because you're raised in a nation that has some type of Christian heritage does not mean that you're perfectly right with God. Here in this nation, people are finding out that Christianity is not what they thought it was. Many people come to America and because they salute the flag, because they attend a church, they believe when they die they're going to make it to heaven. There's a whole lot more to it than that. And that's why I'm saying I want everyone to pray this prayer, no matter how spiritual you are. There's something in this message for you. Everyone pray out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name, In your precious name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 5. Turn the lights down just a little bit. That's fine right there. As I said, in just a few minutes, the light will be going out completely. We'd appreciate you not moving around. If you're under conviction in this place, you're, always, you're already scared. You want to run out and you want to go hide in the bathroom. 
Let me just let you know ahead of time, we've put speakers in the bathroom. <laughs> we found out years ago that people were hiding out in the bathrooms. So if you're in the bathroom and you're listening to me tonight, you can't hide from God. I'm going to read a lengthy portion of this text. I want the lights in the back, if you can, dim those a little bit more. Those of you that are taking notes, that's good right there. Those of you that are taking notes, this is entitled Against the Candlestick. Against the Candlestick. Don't try to understand the title, just write it down if you're taking notes. Against the Candlestick. Daniel chapter 5. Verse 1, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was the king Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished or astounded and perplexed. Now the queen, by reasons of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, for as much as an ex excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king of my father brought out of Jewry? Verse 14, I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou can read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor and for the 
the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him whom he would, would he slew and whom he would he kept alive and whom he would he set up and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him and he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beast and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will and thou his son O Belshazzar has not humbled thine heart thou that knewest all this but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee and thou and thy lords the wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass iron wood and stone which see not nor hear nor know and the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified then was a part of the hand sent from him and this writing was written and this is a writing that was written many many teko uparsin this is the interpreter of the thing many God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it teko thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting but as thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians then commanded Belshazzar and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom in that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain and Darius the Median took the kingdom being about three score and two years old long portion of scripture heavy story my friend and listen at home if you don't see the United States of America, England, Germany, Japan, Scotland, Australia, I can name them all, Korea, in this portion of scripture, then you need to look again. Before you leave tonight, you're going to see the world right here. My first point tonight is this. We live in a society that is caught up in the temporal party spirit. We live in a society that is caught up in a temporal party spirit. Before venturing into this message, please allow me to define what I mean by the party spirit. A party, by definition, is a social gathering for pleasure or amusement. We are all familiar with gatherings that are by the most part good and decent parties. For example, there's nothing wrong with a birthday party. There's nothing wrong with an anniversary party. There's nothing wrong with a retirement party or a graduation party. There's nothing wrong with celebrating something decent that's going on in your family's life. But my friend, listen to me and listen good. We have gone overboard. I'm not coming up tonight to degrade decent moral celebrations, but rather I am coming to you with a word from the Lord about a spirit that has permeated our society. By party spirit, I am referring to those who live for pleasure. Now, I want those brought out here and I want them to surround me. We're going to bring out some millennium balloons. And as I'm speaking, they're going to be bringing these out. I know these are going to distract many of you, so just be ye distracted. <laughs> we live. Just put them all over the platform. We live in a world that is caught up in the party spirit. In a few minutes, I'm going to be sharing a few things with you. And you'll understand fully what I'm talking about. You'll say, now I do understand what you're talking about, Steve. We do live in a party spirit. A party spirit has to do with someone. And everyone listen. Everyone at home listen. Don't change that channel. There are people within the sound of my voice you live for pleasure. 
the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life has saturated you. You live for the next high. You crave the next carnal delight. You are consumed with creature comforts, and you live a life focused on the pleasures of this world. You don't believe me? Go to the mall. Go to Kmart when they're having a blue light special. You'll see the greed. You'll see the cravings. Watch young ladies stand before a mannequin in a store and begin moving their bodies to see what they would look like in that skimpy little outfit. Living for sensual pleasure. People refuse to turn their heads when the prostitutes of this world come sleezing by. They allow poison from hell to enter their eye gate and their ear gate, polluting the very life that has been given them by God. I preached a short while ago a message entitled, The Lovers of Pleasure. And for those of you that we think we preach all hard messages at Brownsville, you haven't been to Brownsville. There's messages here, friend. You just need to pull them up yourself and you'll see that we don't preach judgment all the time. We preach mercy. We preach love. I preached the other night just on the blessings of God. But tonight is different. I spoke one night on what it meant to be a lover. And then what it meant to be a lover of pleasure. And then what it meant to be a lover of pleasure more than the lover of God. The altars were full that night because people realized they didn't have God in their lives. God wasn't their focus. He wasn't the most important thing to them. Tonight's going to be the same. I brought out that night that I preached on the lovers of pleasure that in America we spend $753 billion a year on leisure. $753 billion on leisure. I'm not talking about food. I'm not talking about clothing. I'm not talking about housing expenses. I'm not talking about the necessities of life. I'm talking about leisure. $753 billion. And we gave a meager $23 billion to charity. That's all the charities combined. That's the March of Dimes. That's Jerry Lewis's telethon. That's all of them. That's the bell ringing on Christmas. $23 billion, yet we spent $753 billion on fishing and golf clubs and donuts and balloons and parties and a bigger boat. A bigger, a, 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 a longer cruise. We should be in shock that our children spend the five to seven hours a day watching television. If this current trend continues, our kids will spend 20 years of their life in front of that television set vegetating. Like I said, we should be in shock, but we're not. Everything's okay, as the scripture declares in the story of the rich man in Luke chapter 12. Eat, drink, and be merry. But you need to read again Luke chapter 12 about the rich man. The Bible says God came on the scene in verse 20 of Luke 12 and says, You fool! Today your soul is required of you. Right now. Television website, television, computer websites, advertising and promotion agencies, travel agents, motel chains, restaurants, cruise lines, and a host of other pleasure-oriented businesses are hounding our homes with advertisements on how to spend the New Year holiday. They're all asking the same question. Where will you be when the calendar rolls from December 31st, 1999 to January 1st of the year 2000? Who will you be with? What ballroom will you be dancing in? From what ceiling will the confetti fall? The term millennium madness has been well coined to define this frenzy. I carry with me tonight some of you from these other nations in France. Amsterdam, Britain, Germany, Spain. It's interesting right here. We can pull up your website. You're trying to lure the world. I lived in Spain 
Spain is nothing but a solid party. I couldn't believe the parties. I couldn't sleep at night because there's so many parties going on outside. And I'd go, what you celebrating? We're celebrating a party that's coming up. <laughs> there was always a party. But you can pull up on the website, on the internet. This is called the Millennium Celebration Map. It's a map of all the major celebration spots around the world. And some of these are abomination in the eyes of God. Most every one of them are, friend. They talk about drinking and partying. They talk about getting as sodded as you can get. Come to our nation. Roll in the polluted rivers of our nation. One nation, I believe it's Germany right here. It says at 12 midnight, eat and drink as much as you want and you can go around kissing and hugging total strangers. That's what the Germans are saying. Come to my nation and just let them have a big love affair. Young ladies, don't be surprised if you're raped at 12 midnight. Cruises. They're even closing down Manhattan. They're closing down the New York theater district. They're blacking out the whole district because they're expecting two million people to invade Times Square. And they're gonna be armed. All these cops are gonna be everywhere because they're expecting mass looting and riots. Party, party, party. In our text tonight, Belshazzar was caught up in the temporal party spirit. He was celebrating when in all actuality there was nothing to celebrate. It seemed that he had everything under control. Those around him would believe that he had the magic touch and every wish was his command. But the Bible clearly states in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Belshazzar lived 2,500 years ago, but nothing's changed. By the way, I said that we live in a society that is caught up in a temporal party spirit. But keep in mind, while this nation and the other financially sound nations of the world are partying, the larger population of the world is in poverty. I'm going to say that again. Mike just mentioned our missions trips. BRSM takes people all over the nation. We have graduates from the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry that are working in mud huts right now. Trust me. Those natives in those nations aren't wondering where they're going to spend December 31st. In what plush hotel are they going to be sipping champagne? We are wondering where to spend New Year's while they are wondering if they'll find shelter and a place to spend the night. We're selling out of champagne and they're searching for a bottle of water. We're buying millennium clocks and watches, anticipating the upcoming year, while others are staring at the scorching sun, wondering if they're going to make it one more day through this famine. We're flocking to the malls, frantically hunting for that perfect party frock, that tailored tux with tails, while the majority of the world would give anything for a clean t-shirt and a new pair of blue jeans. We will individually spend in one night what many people make in one year. We're surfing the net, racing to make reservations at that perfect restaurant while billions of others are wondering where to get the next piece of bread. Oh, you don't believe me, friend. Let me tell you right now, and you listen. You don't believe we're living in a nation of partiers? Call a prayer meeting at your church, Pastor. That's the truth. Just call a prayer meeting. One prayer meeting and see who shows up. They can't make it. You want to know why they can't make it? They can't make it because their favorite sitcom's on. They can't make it if it's a morning prayer meeting because they're going fishing. They're going golfing. Don't talk to me about Korea and the move of God in Korea. They pay a price in Korea. Nobody pays a price here. We're partiers. All we want to do is party, 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 party. I meet people that I haven't seen in revival for years. I'll meet them at the mall or I'll meet them at a store. I'll meet them out when I'm grocery shopping and I'll, they'll see me and they'll try to get away from me. And I walk up to them, I say, brother, how you doing? I'm not there to get him all mad and upset. I just want to say hi. But you see it all over his face. What's been going on? 
Oh, man, one man said, Ah, oh, Steve, I'll open up this business, you know, no, 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 start just, just a litany of stupid excuses. Yep. Want to know what it's all about? More, 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 more for me, more for me, more for me. Well, what about God? Where is he in the picture? <laughs> well, the temporal number two, the temporal party spirit has a way of numbing, say numbing. Numbing us to the serious reality of the eternal plan of God. The temporal party spirit has a way of numbing us to the serious reality of the eternal plan of God. Our excitement over the temporal has a way of numbing us to the serious reality of the eternal. I'm going to say that again. Our excitement over the temporal has a way of numbing us to the serious reality of the eternal. After Belshazzar was well into his party, he called for the articles of the temple to be brought in. He became so numb to truth and reality that he began abusing the precious articles of God. He knew better. Friend, you know what he was doing? He had been sipping out of clay goblets. He had been sipping out of ordinary earthenware, Tupperware, if you will. He was sipping out of Walmart stuff. And he goes, I'm sick of this Walmart stuff. I want you to bring me something from Zales Jewelers. I want you to bring me the very best. Bring me what's in the temple. He was numb. The party spirit had taken over. Listen up tonight, friend. It numbs you to the reality of what really is going on outside. Keep in mind that as Belshazzar was sipping on his wine, the armies were gathering outside. I'm going to say that again. As we're partying, as this nation is preparing for the great December 31st fiesta, the hordes of hell are gathering around. They're going, she'll never make it. At 11.58, she's going to die of an overdose. He'll live to the year 2000, but he'll die at 12.07. Drunk out of his mind, that car will go off that bridge and sink into that river. The party spirit has a way of numbing us to the reality of the eternal. I remember what it was like to live in a constant party. I was a drunkard. I was an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. I lived for the next party. And anytime somebody talked to me about the future, I would look at them and say, it's my life. I can do what I want. Get out of my face. I didn't want anything to do with truth. While the party was going on inside, keep in mind Belshazzar was numb to the army that was gathering outside. Isaiah prophesied it in Isaiah 21, 1 through 9. He saw this coming. Belshazzar was drunk on the inside while Darius was determined on the outside. Belshazzar was clutching goblets of gold while Darius was clutching swords of steel. Belshazzar was drinking red wine while Darius was thinking red blood. Oh, I think many of you tonight, many of you tonight have fallen away from God. I want everyone to listen. This is a divine appointment. Many of you have fallen away from God and you know it. You're thinking this good life will go on forever while the devil and the hordes of demons are pacing outside your home waiting for that opportune time to destroy you and drag you into hell. Yesterday I was talking to a high school girl, high school senior, who is grieving over her religious friends who attend church but find nothing wrong with R-rated movies. You want to know what they've done, friend? They allow the eyes, the ears to consume the ways of the world, and it's like an opiate. It numbs them, and after a while, they drift a little bit further from Jesus, a little bit further from Jesus, and things don't bother them the way they used to bother them, and now they can look straight in the eyes of another Christian and say, there's nothing wrong with watching a little sex on television. I'm telling you, the party spirit numbs you to the reality of the eternal. One man asked me the other day, a, a top reporter, he said, you believe in total abstinence, don't you, Steve? He was a reporter from a major newspaper, and I said, yes, I do. 
that he said this to me. Can't I even drink a beer? He's a heathen talking to me, asking me permission if he can drink a beer. I think I was getting to him. People have numbed their minds with vile pictures of violence, sex, and wickedness from the pits of hell. How many times have I seen, have I seen people become so enthralled in the pleasures of this life that they begin to lose focus on reality? The very breath that they breathe is from God, but they begin praising, they begin praising the God of health. I'm going to say that again. You see about jogging. I exercise every day, friend, but I know it's God that gives me the strength to move. It's God that gives me the ability to breathe. It's God that wakes me up in the morning. But I watch people, the very breath that they breathe is from God, but they begin praising the God of health. The very clothes that they wear, car that they drive, home that they live in, jewelry hanging on their body was all created from materials produced by the hand of the Almighty. But in their numbness, they praise the God of gold and silver. Oh, doesn't the Bible say in Deuteronomy 8.18, remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swore to his fathers as it is this day. Yes, the temporal spirit has a way of numbing us to the serious reality of the eternal plan of God. The opiates offered by the party spirit will numb you to the opportunities of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again one more time. The opiates offered by the party spirit will numb you to the opportunities of the Holy Spirit. Right now, the devil's working overtime in this message. He's out there, friend, and he's whispering to some of you, this is too heavy for you, man. You don't need to listen to this. You do not need to listen to this. you got plans for New Year's. You know what you're going to do on New Year's. You've already made reservations. You don't need to listen to that. And you begin to get numbed, and you go up to your refrigerator, and you grab a beer, and you drink the beer, and the more beer you drink, the more whiskey you down, the more pills you pop, the more cocaine you take friend you start feeling you know this religion thing it's really not for me and besides that God knows my body he knows my frame he knows that I'm just a weak person I can't handle all these temptations he knows I'm gonna fall into this and fall into that but God's a righteous God he's a just God and he's a merciful God he's gonna forgive me he's gonna wash me he's gonna forgive me I'm gonna go to heaven anyway and you begin to get numb to the truth the reality of it friend let me tell you something about sin and sin separates. The Bible says that sin separates us from God. Period. And that numbing spirit will come down on us. You listen up from Oklahoma. It'll come down over us. And we won't start, we don't think no more about God as much as we used to. We don't just, he's not as important as he used to be. Just one more drink, just one more movie, just one more sexual escapade, just one more love affair, just one more toke of pot, just one more line of cocaine, and you've numbed yourself. Tonight, God's trying to speak to you. Some of you are looking at me and you're going, I'm not into drugs, I'm not into drinking, I'm not into partying. Friend, how about if we do this? Why don't we line up the hours of your life? Why don't we make a pie chart of our lives? and see what goes where, where pleasure goes, where going after God goes. What little slice of the pie does God get out of a week of your life? You'll spend three hours at the mall going after some clothes and complain about 30 minutes with God in a prayer meeting. Lovers of pleasure. Temporal party spirit, me, me, me. Some of you young ladies, you said you'd never go that far. You said to yourself, I'll never get pregnant. Or you said, I'll never get addicted. But after a few kisses by the lockers, you soon find yourself in the back seat of a car. You see how the few kisses by the lockers is an opiate? It's an opiate. A few kisses and you, you, first you didn't even want to kiss him, but now you've kissed him. Now you've kissed him. It's an opiate. It sort of numbs you. And you go, I like that. He, he loves me. I love him. Next news you know, he, he, he wants to take you for a drive. And he says, honey, all I want to do is we'll just kiss. We'll just kiss. 
and he takes you up onto the mountain and you're, the, the kiss is an opiate. But he's got far more in mind than just a kiss, friend. But you've been numbed to the reality of what could take place. A few weeks later, you could be standing in a doctor's office and he could say, Lady, you're 16 and you're pregnant. You go tell your little lover boy, he's long gone. He's with another little lady up on the mountainside. After a few beers, you find yourself doing other things that you're totally against your better judgment. I'm talking about the party spirit numbs you. It numbs you to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. How many people this Christmas are going to be sitting in rescue missions? They're going to be numbed out of their mind on some opium of the world, and somebody's going to be up there preaching the Word of God to them, but they're numb. The devil's come on and said, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. This is what they always do at rescue missions. This is what they always do at the Salvation Army. This is the way they always preach at the Brownsville Revival. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to listen. It'll be over in a few minutes. The program will be over in a few minutes, and you go back, you can go back to your party lifestyle. Have you ever heard that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Has anybody ever heard that? How can you pour poison down your throat? Keep in mind before I move on that Jesus Christ did not allow the pleasures and temptations of this life to deter him from his purpose. Oh, you want to talk about the party spirit? The party spirit came to him in the wilderness. He came, the devil himself came. And the greatest temptation Jesus faced was when he was standing over the whole world. And the devil says, Party! All of this I will give you if you'll bow down and worship me. You know what the devil was saying to Jesus? I'm going to throw you the biggest party you've ever seen. And you're going to be king. You're going to be the head honcho. You're going to be in the middle of it all. Everyone is going to be around you. All the praise, all the worship, everything. You're going to love it. It's all going to be yours. You don't think the devil knows about parties? The presents would be innumerable. Everything that carnality desires would be at Jesus' fingertips. But he didn't allow the numbing demonic party spirit to deter him from his divine appointment. He looks at the devil and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. How many thank God he made that statement? He set his eyes on Calvary. He fought off all temptations. The Bible says he was but at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Well, friend, Belshazzar was numbed to reality. See, we know reality here because we've read the end of his story. It's a tragic story. Want to know something, friend? God knows the end of your story. Amen. Someday, somebody's going to be reading the end of your story. I look at people I've known over the years, Carrie. Mike, I look at people I've known over the last several years that fell away from God and then died in a car accident. I know their story now. I remember a young man who pulled up to next to me on the highway. He was in Teen Challenge with me. We, matter of fact, we planted a, a watermelon patch together in Teen Challenge up in Missouri. We nurtured those watermelons. We grew those watermelons together. We worshiped God together, but he left the program early. He said, I can make it on my own. I didn't see him for a year. I went ahead and graduated. And then one day I was driving down the road and he pulled up next to me in his truck and he looked over at me and he had a bottle of wine in his hand. I rolled down the window and I said, Bill, what are you doing? He said, it's all right, man. It's all right. And I said, what about Jesus? He goes, I'm all right with God, man. I'm all right with God. Two days later, he hit a tree at 100 miles an hour. His mother called me and asked me if I would preach the funeral. 
I said no. Because I told her I wanted to preach the truth. But that party spirit will numb you to reality. Reality was Bill was going to stand before God in two days. My third point tonight, for those of you caught up in the party spirit, just as in the days of Belshazzar, God is going to raid your party. God was watching Belshazzar's every move. You've heard me say before, there's always three witnesses, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He knows the secrets of men. He writes down every sin. When Belshazzar commanded for the gold and silver vessels, little did he know that he was also commanding the judgment of God upon his life. When Belshazzar reached forth his hand to grab a golden goblet, God reached forth his hand to write on the wall. The Bible says in Daniel 5, 5, that God came down in the same hour. Look this way, friend. That's a scary portion of Scripture. God didn't wait until after the party. God raided his party. God didn't care about what everybody thought. On God's calendar, the time had come. On God's clock, it was a midnight hour. God walked up to Belshazzar and said, Your party, Belshazzar, it's over. Your party is over. And friend, that wasn't the only one he said it to. He walked up to Ananias and Sapphira. He said, Ananias and Sapphira, it's over. Your party is over, Ananias and Sapphira. That wasn't the only one he said it to. Remember King Herod? King Herod was waxing eloquent in a speech, and God said, freeze, that's it. Your party is over. God is in to raiding parties. Remember Saul of Tarsus breathing threatenings against the church, about to go to Damascus and imprison others? God goes, freeze, Saul, it's over. You're not going to touch any more Christians. I'm raiding your party. Tonight he's raiding some folks' party. I'm very serious, friend. You're going to get so right with Jesus in just a few minutes. See, Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. He came to take away the sin of the world. He didn't come to give you a Cadillac. Let me tell you something else. He didn't come to bless Steve Hill with stuff. He didn't come to bless you with stuff. He came to take away the sin of the world. That's all he cares about. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You do what God wants to do, maybe he'll give you a few trinkets. You don't, you don't do what God wants you to do, friend. You'll spend your life trying to get those trinkets. You'll scarf up trinkets here. You'll scarf them up there. You'll, you'll wheel, wheel and deal here. You'll wheel and deal there. You'll barter here and you'll barter there to get a few trinkets that your brother seems to get just out of nowhere. Why? Because he's serving God. He's going after God and the blessings are coming down because he's seeking first the kingdom of God. But keep in mind, friend, tonight, don't you ever forget it. Jesus Christ came to take away the sin of the world. Some of you tonight can sit in front of a TV set and listen up at home, friend. For once, you're watching a decent program. But you can sit in front of a TV set and watch someone slip their clothes off and you don't even get grieved over it. I'm telling you, friend, if you can't watch it on Sunday morning in front of the whole church, it's sin. But I saw something. I want the air turned off in this place for a few minutes. There's too much wind blowing around. I saw something this morning while I was preparing this message. And it's where I got the title, Against the Candlestick. See, there's a move of God going on right now. It's awesome. I want the lights out. It's incredible. Personally, friend, I've never seen anything like it.
But I want you to hear what the Word of God says. Just as in the day of Belshazzar, God will make sure you see what he has written. This is my next point. He will make sure that you see what is written. There's a move of God going on right now all over the world. And God is making sure that everyone understands what is being written. See, there was something in the palace. Call the candlestick. The candlestick was sitting on a table. Belshazzar was partying. The candlestick was just used for light. Belshazzar was partying. But God had a word for Belshazzar. Where do you think God's going to write? The Bible says that it appeared against the candlestick on the plaster of the wall. Why did God do this, my friend? I want to tell you why. In the darkness, God was going to make sure that Belshazzar got the message. He was going to make sure that in all the corners of the palace, whatever else was going on was insignificant. He was going to draw the attention of Belshazzar to the candlestick. And Belshazzar looked over. He had seen that candlestick a hundred times in his drunken state. But now there was something written against it. Right behind the candlestick was the word of the living God. Thou has been weighed in the balance and art found wanton. What this is, friend, this is the light that's shining so bright right now in the darkness of the world. This is the revival that's blazing in Pensacola. This is the holiness preaching that's being preached around the world. It's behind the candlestick, and people are looking. They're going, honey, I can see that. Can you see that? And she said, yes, baby, I can see that. And rather than watch some sitcom, they sit there for 50 minutes and they watch the word of God being preached with fire and holiness across the airwaves. You know what this is, my friend? This, my friend, is what's going on right now. You have walked right up to the candlestick. You're standing right in front of it. The Bible says that his knees began to smote one against another. His countenance changed. Why, friend? Want to know why? Things had changed. Someone else has entered the picture. Someone more powerful than his concubines. Someone more powerful than his party and thousand friends. Someone more powerful than the soothsayers and the astrologers. God had entered the scene. Want to know why the Brownsville Revival is bringing thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes in the arenas? We see four and five, six thousand people running to the altar. I want Lyndall Cooley to come back if you would get to the keyboard. You want to know why they come running? The same reason Belshazzar called for Daniel. They're going. I can't shake this off. This is driving me mad. What does that mean? 
The candlestick is a light. It's shining bright right now. People are understanding the word of God. They're being drawn to the message of the cross. Many of you that have been brought here tonight, it's not a coincidence that you're here. It's a divine appointment. I want you, if you just play softly, Linda, Lord, have mercy. Just play that softly. Oh, man. Friend. Once again, God is riding against the candlestick. He's not riding in some obscure closet. He's right in the middle of the ballroom. He's stepping out on center stage and he's saying, you're going to watch this. You're going to hear this and it's going to be clear. You're going to understand that my son shed his blood on Calvary 2,000 years ago, not so you could hang him on a cross at the, behind your pulpit in your oh. church, not so you can hang him from the dashboard of your car, not so you can put a Yes, Lord, We Will Ride sticker on the back of your car, not so you can put Honk If You Love Jesus. My son died for you 2,000 years ago that you might receive forgiveness of your sin. He's making it clear. He's making it clear. He's redefining sin. People are understanding that sin is separating them from God. That sin is an abomination to God. That sin is the same as grabbing a hammer and grabbing a nail and piercing his hands over and over and over again. Those of you that call yourselves Christians and you can sit in front of a tube or you can sit and listen to a radio or you can watch some girl walk by and you're drawn to her and your eyes begin to lust and your heart begins to throb. Friend, let me tell you something. You're being driven by the party spirit. You're like an animal. Jesus Christ came to take away that sin from you. He came to let you learn how to live holy, righteous, in a God-forsaken world. You know something else I found in this scripture, friend? Does everyone understand the candlestick? It's the light, friend. See this? You can all see the word. You can all see the word. Everybody can see the word, those of you at home. You can see the word. That's why God rode against the candlestick. He wanted to make sure people understood it. That's why God is raising up. And that's my last point tonight, friend. God has always got a man who will speak to those caught up in the party spirit. For those partying in the antediluvian period, that's time, the time before the flood, God had Noah. For the thousands at Belshazzar's party, God had Daniel. For those numbered by religion, the, for those numbed by religion and superficial acts of piety, God had John the Baptist. For Ananias and Sapphira, who were caught up in the wealth of this world, God had Peter. For the English in the 1700s, caught up in the drunkenness and reveling, to the church who had lost the power and presence of God, God sent John Wesley. For those about to witness the turning of a century in the beginning of the year 2000, God once again has raised up righteous, holy men and women of God. Oh, and you're going to understand. That's why in Minneapolis last week, 4,000 people came and got right with God at the altars. That's why some of my own family members, Mike, some of my own family got saved in Minneapolis. They came down to the altar, wept tears of repentance, and you want to know what they were saying? I've never heard it like this before. Why, friend? God is once again writing his word against the candlestick. You'll understand it. You'll see it. He's not under a veil. He's not behind a curtain. He's always got a man that will come and let you know what he's saying. But tonight, for those of you caught up in the temporal party spirit, if you allow yourself to get caught up in that temporal party spirit, you will experience 
the eternal parting spirit. I'm going to say that again. If you allow yourself to get caught up in the temporal party spirit, you will experience the eternal parting spirit. The Bible says in Daniel 5.30, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. You'll read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The Bible goes on to say that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart and he said, I will destroy man. You keep up with your party and friend, your party spirit, you're going to experience the parting spirit. Come on. The parting spirit. The Spirit of God left Belshazzar's party. It was over for Belshazzar. Trying to help you tonight. Against the candlestick. Jesus, I want to say something to you tonight before we give an altar call. I just want to thank you that once again people are understanding the cross. I want to thank you, Jesus, that once again people are understanding the blood. That without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That they're beginning to understand that the only way they can receive remission, forgiveness of sin, is by asking you to forgive them. And Lord, they're understanding once again that if they confess their sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive them their sin and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Belshazzar, Jesus is dead and gone. You know all about his story. So are Ananias and Sapphira. So is Herod. But Jesus, we're alive. And once again, you're blazing your word on the tablets of our heart. You're not writing on the plaster anymore, are you, Jesus? You're writing it on the fleshly table of our hearts. And God, you're bringing back to remembrance by the light of your Holy Spirit the things that we've learned in Sunday school, the things that we've learned in preaching messages, and things that we've learned by watching Billy Graham on television, and things that we've learned by reading your word. Your Holy Spirit is illuminating one again, once again, Jesus. And once again, your word is against the candlestick. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Everyone stand. Turn the lights up just a little. That's enough right there. Move the chairs to the left and the right. No one else moving around. No one else moving around, just those that are moving the chairs. I'm beginning to have an altar call. Everyone in this room that's got sin in their life, you're doing things that Jesus would never do. You're going to come down here in just a minute. You're going to come and kneel at these altars. You're going to kneel at these altars. You're not going to hesitate. To be perfectly honest with you, I don't like Belshazzar's story. I wish that his legs had smoked together. I wish that he had screamed out Lindell to the living God. I wish he had fallen to his face. And I, I wish that he'd screamed to all the concubines and wives and all the partiers and revelers. I wish the Bible recorded that he screamed to all of them. And he said, give me those goblets of gold and silver. Go wash them out and put them back into the temple. I wish he had screamed out, I want everyone on their face repenting before God. And I wish that's the way the scripture ended. And I wish on the wall God wrote again, Thou art forgiven, Belshazzar. But that's not the way it was.
But we live in a time right now, friend, of mercy. Mike, I don't know how long it's going to last. If I was God, I'd have gotten rid of Steve Hill back during his drug days. Because I was one who had turned my face to heaven and cussed him out just like that. But then one day, see, I was in total darkness. One day, a Lutheran minister came to my house and held the word against the candlestick. And he said, Steve, Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. He died for you. He bled for you. Give your life to him, Steve. And I understood it for the first time in my life. Got saved, and that was 24 years ago next week. 24 years. He is a merciful God. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave these candles burning. Those of you that are away from God, you're going to come in just a minute. You're going to come quickly. Up of you in the balcony, you're going to come. Those of you at home, many of you at home are already on your knees. I can feel that in my spirit. You're already repenting because you know you're away from God. You know exactly what the party spirit has done. Now, don't get me wrong, friend. There's nothing wrong with celebrating. We're going to have a big celebration here on December 31st. We're going to have this. That's a Friday night, by the way. We're going to have a Friday night service right here at Brownsville. And we're going to rejoice that we're living one more day. I mean, hey. But the Spirit's right. The Spirit's right. I'm thanking God that I'm making it to the year 2000. I might not make it. I might die before then. But if I make it to the year 2000, I'll thank God that I saw the turning of a century. It's not the turning of a millennium. The millennium's another year from now. The year 2001 starts the turning of the new millennium. But this is the beginning of the year 2000. And I, I'll thank God that, hey, this is cool. I've thought about this for a long time, and here I am. Thank you, Jesus. I won't tip up a champagne bottle and guzzle it down, praising the God of health. Many of you are backslidden tonight. You're doing things that Jesus would never do. You once knew the Lord. See, the Bible says that Belshazzar knew better. Daniel said to Belshazzar, You knew all these things about your father, Nebuchadnezzar. And that's just like many of you in this room. You know what's right and what's wrong. At home, you know what's right and what's wrong. Kids stand perfectly still. Kids up front. Young boys, young boys, no talking. Shh, no talking. This is holy ground. You know what's right and wrong, but you do it anyway. You're going to get right with God tonight, friend. You're not going to hesitate. Those of you that are backslidden, those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, you're going to come meet the God that wrote on the wall 2,500 years ago. You're going to meet the one who died for you 2,000 years ago. You're going to meet the same God that poured out his spirit on England back in the 1700s. You're going to meet the same God that came into to Charles Finney's study and was hit him with the power like electricity was shooting through him back in the 1800s. You're going to meet the same God that back on Father's Day 1995 swept through this church and began transforming thousands of people. You're going to meet the same one who saved me 24 years ago. He'll deliver you from drugs, alcohol. He'll deliver you from the sickness of this world. He'll set you free. Those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, you're going to come forward in just a minute. And those of you that are religious, some of you that are religious, you're abusing the things of God. The articles in the temple, what are they, Steve? Why don't we start with this one? 
the Bible. I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many have more than two of these in your house? Don't raise your hand. How many have more than five? How many have more than ten? How many do you read? How often do you read? What's sitting on top of them? The goblets of gold and silver were, un were unimportant to Belshazzar. The Bible is unimportant to you. Church, good for you. Sunday morning, you won't miss it. But boy, don't let the pastor go back past 12. Don't let the church service go past 1, because you're out of there. Don't talk to me about how holy you are, friend. It ain't holy to go to church on Sunday morning. That ain't holy. Holy is going to prayer meeting on Saturday morning, church on Sunday night, church Wednesday night, volunteering to help in the nursery on Sunday morning. That's starting to get holy. Don't tell me about your piety on Sunday morning. Don't tell me that you sing in the choir, okay? I love choirs. I love our choir. But singing in the choir won't save you, friend. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. Did you know right now, Lindell, there are choirs that are preparing for great cantatas there's great cantatas going to be sung this Christmas, the last Christmas of the century. Right. Great cantatas. Did you know there's people, look this way, everybody, there are people that are backsliding right now. Why? Because they didn't get the part that they wanted in the cantata. Right. They're going to leave the church and come New Year's, they'll be drunk out of their mind. I want the team to come join me if you would. You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. See this candelabra? This is a religious article. You should have seen it when I first found it in an antique shop. It's from the 1800s. It was pitiful, ugly. You could even tell it was brass. It had been neglected, thrown out by somebody. It was even on sale because it was so pitiful looking. When I saw it, I thought, you know, there's a message in there. That dirty old candelabra, there's a message. God talks about the candlestick. But that's the way we treat things of God. and Some of it's just trash. Others really has great symbolism. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of religious people here, you don't know God. Religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. I'm shooting straight with you tonight. Some, for some of you, this is the first time to ever hear me speak. I love you dearly, friend. But I got saved 24 years ago from drugs and alcohol. And I've been preaching this way for 24 years. You may never see me again, and I may never see you again. And if you should die, and I should die around the same time when we're standing before God, I want you to be able to turn over to me and say, thank you for sharing the truth. I don't want you to turn to me and say, boy, you sure were a neat preacher. I don't care about being a neat preacher. I want people's lives to be touched by Jesus. This team is going to sing, Lord, have mercy. Those of you at home, those of you listening by radio, those of you that have pulled up the website, right now you're going to have the opportunity to get on your face before God. I'm going to open up these altars, and the only thing that's going to hold you back is pride. If you need to get sin out of your life, pride will say, I don't need to go down there. I don't need to go down there. You know, one thing's interesting that Belshazzar did not do. He did not blow out the candles. See, the candle lit up the man's hand. Some of you would blow out the candles tonight and go, I don't want to hear about that. Don't talk to me about Jesus. But I'm going to give you more credit than that, friend. I believe that you want to respond, that you want to get right with God, that you want Jesus Christ to change your life, and you are going to come down here. The only thing that will hold you back is pride. The Bible doesn't record Belshazzar breaking out in hilarious laughter and mocking God. The Bible says his countenance was changed. Your countenance needs to change tonight, friend. And you need to say, Jesus, 
I'm getting off my high horse. I'm shaking this pride off of me. And I'm going to get right with God tonight at the Brownsville Revival. I'm going to get all the sin out of my life. When this altar call is open, you're going to come quickly from the balcony, from this main floor. Everyone that's doing things that Jesus would never do. Sin has separated you from God. Jesus shed his blood on Calvary to take away your sin. And that is the primary reason you're at the Brownsville Revival. The anointing is secondary, friend. God is not going to anoint a dirty vessel. And I'm going to do one more thing because I have been buffeted. by hell over this message. I'm totally free now. But I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to do something right now. See, by the way, this message does not just go out to you. There will be people that write us from Hong Kong. There will be people in Argentina. There will be people in Australia, in San Francisco, that will come to the Lord through against the candlestick. And the devil knows that. God may be speaking to a young man, he's about to kneel in his home, that's going to be an evangelist, that may set the whole western United States ablaze with the gospel. And the devil knows this kind of stuff. He knows what God's up to. God's up to setting a fire all over this nation and the world. So I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to bind the devil. And as soon as I bind the devil, as soon as I bind him, every one of you that need to get right with God, you're going to come quickly. As soon as I bind him. Now, you've got a shackle around you. If you need to get right with God, there's a shackle around your leg. And as soon as I bind the devil, that shackle's going to pop off of you. The devil has absolutely no authority with this prayer. He has no choice but to let you go. And if you're not right with God, you need to step out and come down to this altar. If you choose not to come down here, listen and listen well then that shackle is going to go back over your leg because if you don't come down you're saying to Jesus Jesus I know about my sin the devil knows about my sin you Jesus know about my sin and I choose tonight not to do anything about my sin so you can say devil I don't want Jesus I want you you might as well say that to the devil because there's only in or out Heaven or hell, Jesus or Satan, there's no gray area. There's no, I'll just go to church more often. That don't cut it, friend. God's not looking for more religious people. God's looking for righteous, holy people. I'm going to give this altar call. I'm going to bind the devil. If you need to get right with God, you're going to come quickly. Satan, I come to you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, loose him and let him go. I bind you. I bind you. Now come on. 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 Kneel. 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 Kneel.
Come on. Come on. If you would mark Everyone at the altar, stay where you're at. Oh, Lord, who could stay? so clear you made sure I understood Jesus now wash me now cleanse me cleanse me Jesus wash me Jesus cleanse me Lamb of God cleanse me Lamb of God take all my sin away pray that to him tonight take all my sin away Jesus Fred, you better come now. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. If you're coming, come in 60 seconds. At the end of 60 seconds, I'm going to snuff out every light on this candle. There's coming a time, friend, his spirit will no longer contend with you. There will not be any more against the candlestick. There will not be any more light illuminating the message of God. It will be over. If you're coming, come now. 60 seconds. 55 50 Come on to stay where you're at everyone else turn to the person next to you and ask them if they need forgiveness when someone asks you if you need forgiveness don't lie if you're away from Jesus you say yes and then both of you come down both of you come down turn to the person next to you ask them if they need forgiveness and then bring them with you come on come on come on I don't think it's going to be long from now. The light's going to be out. The light's going to be out. You're going to say, Jesus, just one more time. Light the candlestick, Jesus. I want to see your message. I want to see the word. What do you have for me? But it's over. It's over. It's over. His presence has left. Jesus. 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 Cry out to him.
You can still come. Come on. We're closing, but you got a moment in time. You got space to repent. You got space to repent. Come on. Come on. Everyone at the altar, keep your heads bowed. We're going to pray right now. Everyone at the altar, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Many of you have poured out your heart to God, but right now we're going to corporately pray together. Those of you from other countries, I just want you to pray this prayer as your translator translates it to you. Just pray this prayer. But everyone at this altar, those of you at home that are kneeling, I want you to pray this prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. Now pray it out loud. Don't mumble this prayer. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. Thank you, Jesus, for the light of the candlestick. Thank you, Jesus, that I could see your word that I could understand, I understand your word. I ask you tonight to forgive me. I have sinned and I'm sorry. Wash me clean. Make me new. I repent. And tonight, Jesus, I pray that you would be my savior be my Lord and my very best friend. I want you to be my closest companion. From this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Jesus, come live your life through me. I give myself to you, to you in your precious name, in Jesus name, in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Glory.